Welcome. It's good to have your company again this evening. I wonder how you've spent your day today? Well, you may have seen, if some of you follow me on Facebook, I've got a little bit into baking, something I'm starting to enjoy to do. And I know that for this afternoon, for just a couple of hours, that's what I did. Made those wonderful cupcakes that we seem to enjoy. And I know that once we get back to a little bit of normality, I'll share some of those with you, if you like. But it is good to see you, and I hope you too have had a lovely day today. The weather's been kind again, hasn't it? So as we come together now in our time of worship, in this small time together, I just pray now that you will just sort of settle where you are. Because as we come now in God's company, I'm just going to share these words. Because the Lord who calls us each individually by name, he is here with us now. And that's wherever you are. So let us come this night to worship. We praise you, Lord, because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Open our hearts that we may better understand your call to us. Lord, we are not always very good at listening to you, especially if we think you're going to say something we may not like. We are sorry that so often we are not prepared to give you and others the space to speak to us. Forgive us our deafness, our impatience, our stubbornness that block out your word. Amen. This is After that beautiful song, let us remain and be still before God, as we just close our eyes for a moment. Come, Spirit God, take our hands and lead us where you want us to go. Be our guide in the darkness, our companion when we face despair. Urge us to the farthest limits until at last we ascend to heaven to be held in your loving arms. Amen. The 
The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realised that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls to you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak for your servant is listening. Amen. We're still in the season of Epiphany and during this season we hear about God being revealed and his call upon our lives. We've heard that beautiful moving passage this is Samuel, given to God at birth and taken to the temple when he was weaned and then continues to live with Eli. He neither knows God personally nor understand what's going on and what's happening. Yet God knows him by name and character. Sadly, today, society features many nameless people. Somehow when we hear on the news that 500 people have lost their jobs or that 5,000 children a day die from a waterborne disease, somehow it doesn't have the same impact as it would if we knew each of them by name. Names make people real. I recall when I was at school that you would either call your teacher Sir or Miss and colleagues at work were often called by their surnames. A certain distance that kept relationships on a respectful, slightly less than personal level. But today, first names are more familiar and can on occasions be used in a casual manner. But here, God calls Samuel's name as he calls us by name. Our personal identity is so important to us. Our name, it gives us value, allows us to hear our call to mission. In the hymn, I the Lord of sea and sky, Samuel's response, here I am Lord, is followed by a question, is it I? Something that comes from most of us well before we can confidently respond to God's call. Identifying our vocation is frequently a long, drawn-out process and a decision comes only after testing that call, as I have found out upon my own life. Having to be open in prayer, earnest prayer, to have conversation with those that I trust well. And knowing that within that, I may then be led where I had not expected, which is not an easy task at all. But it is during those times that I have learned so much about myself as I journey with him and as I listen. 
we each can respond to that call. And however great that calling may be for all of us, the greater challenges face us day by day. Can we then remain humble rather than becoming self-important, learning to know better the one who calls us, and listening to that voice even when the message that we hear can be hard and difficult? If I say to you this evening, the Iron Lady, you'll know of course who I'm probably referring to. Old age and the frailty it brings is difficult for anyone, but how much more difficult must the contrast be if you have been especially powerful in your prime? That was one of the key questions posed by the Margaret Thatcher biopic. The Iron Lady, a film which starred Meryl Streep as a former Conservative Prime Minister and first female Prime Minister of Britain, Margaret Thatcher. The movie, if anyone has seen it, presents her life and her career through a series of flashbacks by old age dementia in the present day. It moves around quickly the politics that made her such a controversial figure. The Falklands War, the handling of the miners' strike and so on. And instead, concentrates on her calling, character and her ambition suggesting that perhaps her strength of personality may have been both the source of her power and, as with success and self-belief, seemingly led to a growing failure to respect others, her eventual downfall. We see her beginning to flourish as a young woman. She's called to politics as she hears her father speak at a conference. Our children today will be the leaders of tomorrow and she is encouraged in that sense of calling by the support and understanding of her husband, Dennis. She becomes a world leader. But we also witness her fall from grace as she ignores the warnings from colleagues who, tired of the bullying, break out in mutiny, clinging on desperately until her husband says, she won't win this time, and she resigned in 1990. The director of that film stated, Whatever your opinion, the film certainly provokes both sympathy for human frailty and hard questions about the privilege and responsibility of power, and the balance between leading and listening. The passage that we've heard from Samuel also has a key role in identifying the change of direction of Israel and points us towards Samuel's future role. In chapter 2 we would read that Eli's sons had sinned against God and that a prophecy of judgment was given on Eli. And so with dimming sight and too weak to reign in the behaviour of his sons, the elderly priest is clearly struggling. He has served well throughout his life. But by this stage, he seems to become either unable or unwilling to understand what might be required of him and to carry it out. He rebukes, but does not dismiss. His sons who are abusing the privilege of their positions in the temple and the bullying the people that they should be helping. He seems no longer to be able to hear God's voice himself and throughout the kingdom. It's perhaps not surprising that Eli's awareness is so dulled that he has to be woken three times before he realises that the voice Samuel can hear must be the voice of the Lord. Yet Eli still has wisdom enough to recognise the situation in the end. He has brought Samuel up knows his character to be trustworthy. Eli seems to be patient with the boy, despite the disturbed sleep. And finally, he is able to give Samuel the guidance he needs to be able to hear God's message well. 
The message Samuel had for Eli was not either easy to give or to receive. Perhaps it's not surprising that Eli's perceptions are so dulled that he has to be woken those three times. Eli encourages Samuel, encourages him by name, not to be frightened and to listen carefully. Despite the boy's youth, Eli accepts Samuel's message to be God's word. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems to be good. Perhaps for us, Eli may not be a perfect model for us to follow, and his eventual fate is not what we might have hoped for. But he does still have the humility to accept God's judgment and to help Samuel become what he is called to be. This is a passage that sometimes we can explore with young people and with children. And we are naturally encouraged to remember that even those who might seem too young or insignificant are important to God and can serve him well too. Sometimes we have to be nudged to hear God's message by those around us. No matter how difficult it can be, which will take us sometimes out of our comfort zone as we step out in obedience and trust. Even when we know that we have failed and continue to fail and we are all too painfully aware of our own frailties, if we humble ourselves, come in prayer to listen to God's message, we can still be a part of God's plan, no matter how small, no matter how large. Such is the grace of God for us all. Let us now hear those wonderful words in our next song, I the Lord of Sea and Sky.
we come together in a time of prayer. And these prayers are for a time of listening. And I ask that you, in the silence, that you listen for God speaking to you. Let us pray. What have you to say to the world, God of justice? We speak to you of anger, of war, of corruption, of refugees, of suspicion and hatred. We pray for wisdom to show the world a better way. What have you to say to the church, God of faith? We speak to you of plans and visions, of doubts and mistrust, of hopes and fears. We pray for guidance to be your servants to the community. What have you to say to those who suffer, God of love? We speak to you of friends, neighbours and strangers, those who are sick in body, mind or spirit, those in need of care, those who have lost lives over these past year and months. We pray for healing and wholeness for them all. What have you to say to us, God of all? We speak to you of our own longings, of difficult choices, of divided loyalties and of wonderful opportunities. We pray for faith to follow the movement of your spirit. Lord, this is our prayer. Help us to know and do your will. God who has spoken throughout history, help us to hear your voice calling us this day. Amen.
final breath shall be forever Jesus when shadows lengthen before my eyes my Lord and friend companion through the valley when dearest ones are left behind his hand will lead May I encourage you as we draw this evening to a close to take some time in quiet either this evening or later in the week at home or wherever you are to think about whether there have been some hard messages that God might have for you and to ask God's help in being open to his voice afresh and anew again. So as we close, I wish to share with you this prayer. God, you know me inside and out. You know what I get right and what I get wrong. You know what I find easy and what I find difficult. You know what I need to be able to grow and you know who I can become. Help me to know myself inside and out. Help me to do more of what's good and less of what's wrong. Challenge me when I get lazy and encourage me when things are hard. Help me to know what I need to do to become what you want me to be. Speak to me and call me because Lord, I am listening. Amen and a blessing for you all. May grace and truth grow in you. May light and strength flow from you. May love and hope be showered upon you. And may God's blessing be with you all. Evermore. Amen. And I look